Pleasant Sabbath, everybody. I'm not wearing a skirt. I'm wearing what you call in the island a sulu. It's actually a traditional and very prominent way of actually presenting yourself. Even the kings and the prime ministers of the island community, from Papua New Guinea all the way down to Tahiti, uh, you'll find that they dressed up uh, like this. I love you, Pastor Russell. Thank you, Pastor Andrew. Um, yes, the cloud of death has hovered above our church. Twelve months ago, I care for a gentleman whose family was a Christian. They were Christians and they loved God. But to him, he denied the Lord because of the death of his father. And for 12 months, God put me in his place to care for this gentleman. And on Tuesday afternoon, he closes his eyes and sleeps. So yes, our family has been touched so much with sadness. I like to thank the Slade family uh, so much for these beautiful songs of worship that we sang today. I'll tell you what, I said to my wife while I was actually unpacking the stuff this morning, I'm very nervous. Um, because the last time I took the service here was about an hour, I think. Is that right? You don't mind another two hours? <laughs> I just want to shout out, I know he's watching online in WA to my oldest son, which is actually your assistant pastor. Grant is his birthday today. I just want to put him on a spot. I posted some stuff on my social media, and I rang him this morning on our way to church, and I said, I'm sorry for what I posted. He said, Dad, you're not sorry. <laughs> Let me pray. Father God, I pray in a humble way. Use me as your voice. Speak to your beautiful sons and daughters, and those who are online, please. I pray that may your voice be heard in their hearts through your spirit. And they may find you, Lord, for some difficult times that we're going through right now. I know, Father, the last enemy is death. And you will destroy it and never will be when we get together with you in that glorious place. Heaven is our home. Pray, Father, Lord, that you who speak through me, equipped their hearts with your spirit, as you always have, to hear your voice, my humble prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. What is God really like? Let me just get stuff out of my pockets. Yes, they do have pockets. Randall, yes, they do have pockets. Yes. Yes, they do. Um, I apologize to our viewer online. I normally do walk around, and um, I, I try... It, gives me, it makes me more relaxed when I'm sharing God's word, and I love sharing God's word. What is God really like? Now, about 11 years ago, I had the opportunity to pastor at Carol Lundy Aboriginal Education Center, which is now Aboriginal Education Community. And that's nine hours north of Perth, 60 kilometers north of Mikathara, and it's about nine hours away from Broome, three hours away from Newman, two hours west of Wiluna, and at about six hours away from Jigalong, where you'll find the story of the rapid proof fence was birthed out. And the fourth generations of those ladies who have walked the story of the rapid proof fence, actually, I taught them at that school in Carolundi. This question came from a, a, a year 12 student. His name is Dylan, and I had the authority to mention his name. He's one of those golden child, you know half caste Aboriginal, who think that they can do the things they want to do. But you know, he was very curious about God. And he asked me the question when we were out in the bush, hanging out there in the middle of a 45 degree heat. He said, Pastor, I want to ask you a question. What is God really like? It formed a series that I actually created and it's on my website on Sermon Central's. 
that I actually created, like, what is God really like? And he answers the questions on all the attributes of God in your life and my life. And now we all know the attributes of God through the scriptures. And we'll find it in the Bible, in the New Testament, of all the spirit gift, peace, love, joy, comfort, compassion. And so this morning, I want to answer that question. And this is one of it. Is this working? Yeah, I need to turn it on. Sorry, my friend. Yes. He reminded me to turn it on. What is God really like? I want to share with you the God that I believe, what he really likes sometimes. He likes to get his hands dirty. Not dirty in the sense that he's doing bad things. Not dirty in the sense that he's doing dirty things. Like we know in our modern day when somebody says, I've got my hands dirty. It means that you're doing some bad dealing. Not in that sense, but in a sense that he loves to get his hands dirty, mingled together to wipe away the sins of our journey in life. And so that's why I've entitled it, What is God Really Like? God with Dirty Hands. And two points are up there on our board. God in a trench and the God who dirty his hands for you and for me. Let me rephrase that. The God who dirty his hands for anyone. In Mark chapter 1, verse 40, I won't have a two-hour sermon because I've got my wife here with me this morning. When we travel in the country churches, I love my wife. She will make sure that I've actually slowed down and finished the sermon on time. I think I told stories so many times of the late Pastor Mo, uh, Rex Mo, who's the former president of this conference at um, Warhope when they were in the old church. And I was invited to take their service, and I rock up there, and Pastor Mo said, Oh, I remember you. It sounds like a lyric of a song. And you know, I preached, and I went over one minute over 12. Pastor Mo was sitting in the pews, and you know, if you, go, if you remember the old Warhol Church, Warhol Church, they only had two sets of pews, and in the middle, he'll sit right in the middle, and he put out his rocking stick, and he put out his left leg, and he went like this with his right hand. <laughs> so every time I preach, I actually mention to churches that I travel in our countrysides and some other states that I've invited to preach, that yes, I know, I have my medications at 12 o'clock too. That's true, I, I love eating, I love eating. You know, Grant loves eating. Happy birthday, son. Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 45. If you look to it in your, script, in your Bible, or whether it's in your iPhone or things, let me read it to you from the NIV, New International Version. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony of them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stay outside in lonely places. Yet, the people still came to him from everywhere. This is Carolundi Aboriginal Education Center. It's an oasis in the middle of nowhere in the Bilbo regions of WA. It's in the land of the Madu people, people that I fell in love with, people of the Red Desert. It is the only place you'll find greenish around in this side of the country. Everywhere is red dirt. It's just about 500 meters away from the Great Northern Highway that links Perth to Broome to the Kimberley and to North. Carolundi Aboriginal Center is known for their water. 
known for their beautiful water because they, the, the, the church has built a reverse cycle, whatever it is. I have no idea. I'm not a water person. I'm not a mechanical person. But it produced water that pumps out of the Cascoyne River that's underneath where the school is. When I was called to Keralundi in 2009, left the shore of this country when I was pastoring at Broadmeadow Simon Church, which is now Burukul Church, there was one great advice that was given to me by the Australian Union Conference. It was, Rob, the clothes that you're wearing, you can wash them again. But if you sit down and spend time with them on the dirt you will find that you will win them for Christ. When we get ourselves in the spot where we know that we can share Jesus with anyone, then we'll become like Jesus in the story of the leper this morning. Beautiful place. We even got our own airport. We've got a landing strip that actually most of the missionaries and, and the delivery person, people from Perth, will fly in, and even the doctors will fly in. And it's just on the left hand side of, right hand side to you guys, but left hand side to me on that picture of Central. Oh, yeah. Carol Lundy. You know, the kids found this goana. They call it in Maru language, it's a bunker. And I thought they were talking about a bunk, you know, to sleep on. I said, it's a bunker, and they brought it to me. They thought I was scared. <laughs> Typical New Zealanders, eh? I just heard on the news this week that somebody, some New Zealanders rock up and just touch a snake. We're so curious because there's no snake in New Zealand except for the ones in the zoos. It's when we lower ourselves to the dirtness of life, we can win souls for the kingdom. This, uh, I had the author authorization, I apologize to the aboriginals, uh, for having the photo of this beautiful lady, matriarch of the ministry in Wiluna and also in the Bilbo region. Mama Noni Fama was actually, her land and her husband, the late Kenny Fama, actually their land is where Gina Reinhardt and Foster have their mining on it. Beautiful lady. Beautiful lady. So what I'm trying to tell you this morning is this. God in a trench. When Jesus came into this place, there was a leper that was an outcast to each and every person in the village in the first century Judean culture. It was a place where this man would like to find this healer who actually healed those who were sick before him. And if you find in the first part of the chapter, you'll find that Jesus was healing and casting out demons. And then he came to town, and he saw this leper that was eagerly wanting to be healed. What is God really like? God loves to be in the trench of life to save a soul that's been outcast by our standard view. The way Jesus himself interacted with the leper, leper Victim is the great illustrations of God's compassionate love for humanity. You see, let me take you back to the first century. I like this because Pastor Andrew, I think Pastor Andrew told a story about a few, I think it was last month, on this story. And I sat there and I said, yes, I've got a story to tell if I get a chance to preach. Because it is this very scene that you'll find that the God that you love and the God that I love and the God that people question what he really likes is a God that likes to scoop down to the dirtiness of life to pick up a sinner just like me and you and actually wash away the sins that we have. It's a God that actually likes to meddle with the things that are out of the ordinary, the things that are out of places. Because in this traditional first century, you weren't allowed to get near a leba. You weren't allowed to actually speak to them. You weren't allowed to give them anything. You weren't allowed to actually even touch them. If you touch them, you are forbidden for, for seven days. Wait a minute. Let, let me say this word again. If you touch them, you will be isolated for seven days. That's a modern terminology, eh? 
COVID-19. If you touch a leper, you'll be isolated for seven days. Leviticus chapter 13, Leviticus chapter 14, you'll find the story of skin disorders and what will happen to a person that has it and what will happen to people that are actually associated with it. His disease was known as a result in the first century, as a result, sorry, result of affliction from God. For some, this man is a sinner. His disease deserved punishment. And the greatest thing about the God that we believe is that he loves to turn our thinking the other way around. Even the well-to-do people, even the sophisticated religious leaders, respected members of society, if they ever catch this skin disorder, leprosy, they will be unfortunately be banished from society, condemned to life of shame. It is known that if a leper comes through town, they have to yell and scream out, unclean, 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 so that everybody in the marketplace and in the street of Jerusalem will know that they're coming so they can actually exit clean out the street. They don't have to stand around. They don't have to hang around because they have to get as far as possible away from this particular person that's got labor. Most people can't comprehend the kind of terror that leprosy produces in our modern day today. But the culture, context, tells us in the scripture that when Jesus came, he flipped it all around. He was moved. He was filled with compassion. The reason why I read uh, the NIV, the New Intellectual Trans, uh, Version of the Scripture, because it has the word indignant. And indignance can be translated in both ways. It's feeling of either happy, compassion, or feeling of anger. That's from the Webster Dictionary and the Collins Dictionary. Got nothing to do with my family. But yeah, I think my great-grandfather might be, but I'm not too sure. But I like to say it when I go to college and when I was at college. It's a dictionary, Collins Dictionary, yep, family. We islanders like to play around. So let me just say this. So all the other translations, even the King, King, King James Version says, he was filled overfilled and overwhelmed with compassion. Yes, he was overwhelmed with compassion towards his labor. But he was also angry at sin. You get me? So the two different meanings can actually work together. He was upset at how sin has destroyed the life of this man and caused every single standard human being at that time to cast him out and make him not want to be in the community. Yet Jesus turned around and flipped their mind setting the other way around. What is God really like? God who dirty his hands for anyone, including you and me. One of the greatest movements that Jesus did on this story is when he stopped. He looked at this man. He turned around and walked forward towards this man. I'm sure the disciples who were following were going, what in the world is happening here? What are you doing? It reminds me of the story of the Phoenician woman in Matthew chapter 15 when they were walking along the border of Sidon and Jerusalem and actually a Phoenician woman came begging him for mercy. It's one of those powerful stories that I hold dear to my heart because sometimes we think straight theology, we think straight thinking, but God turns it the other way around because the disciples said to Jesus, cast her away because it's shameful that she's hanging out behind us because she was a heathen. She was a Phoenician woman. She didn't believe in the Torah, but she believed in the Savior. 
She believed in the healer. And the God that I know, what is he really like? He likes to teach me in WA how to sit down in the dirt to win the aboriginal people for the kingdom. Jesus was a healer, but he wasn't just a healer. He was the healer who used his very hands to catalyze the miracle of God's grace. Now, I'm, I didn't make that up. It came from my heart. I didn't get it from any books. I like that statement. I'll put it on my social media. He wanted and was willing to be close to this man. The touch that he made was to us, the common people, and to the people of society at that time, looks like a very bad choice. But Jesus wanted to touch that man, to show to this man that I love you, that I'm here for you, that my touch is an intimate touch by a powerful God. Now, you don't need to say amen, but I love an amen after that. I was once told in in the North Coast, Robert, we are preaching to Australian churches. I said, yes, I know. And I know. It's a lyric of a song. See, grace and God's power, my dear friends, are not enemies of one another. It doesn't show that we have a weak God. It shows that we have a powerful God who can step out of the splendor of heaven and become a person in the street, just like you and me, in order to win those for the kingdom. We need to get our theology in a way that Jesus saw how the gospel should be spread. We need to get out of our traditional thinking in order to know that God wanted more than what we think. My ways are not your ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. In the book of Isaiah, declare the Lord. You see, touch is what people need. As I said, the, the, the story of death hover above our church this week, both in my personal life and both in Leilani and our dear family's life. And it affected most of us. I was uh, texting with Pastor Andrew yesterday, and I said, I'm actually contemplating changing my sermon, but I won't. Because I know that death is a thief, but we have the blessed hope. And that blessed hope is when Jesus opened the curtains of heaven and come with a shout of Michael the archangel and the trumpet of God. And those who die in Christ with their faith cemented at the cross will be arised first. And we will be dancing in the street, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> we will be dancing in the street of heaven. I would love to do some skiing on that crystal sea. I love to see if I can get a pick out and pick out the goals of that golden street because I never found one in WA when I was there. I tried to kick a stone because I was told there was a man that had 90 gram of gold, he kicked the stone and actually all the, 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 the soil fell off and he picked it up it was gold actually wow so I tried to kick the stone while I was there well, so I take the kids out every afternoon with our staff so we pack three buses and we go out and, and, and everywhere I go I see kick the stone and the boys will go Pastor what are you doing? I say I'm just testing out the steel thing on my, my boots When Jesus and his grace touched the liver, it healed him not only physically, but spiritually. If you are brokenhearted because of the loss of a loved one, I want you to know that you are not alone. The text I always preach in sermons is Psalms chapter 23. In fact, to Jesus, the one respected by society, we're often the dirty ones. 
Mm. It wasn't the leper that was actually sick. It was actually, it wasn't the prostitute that was selling herself or his, himself. It wasn't the tax collector who disgusted Jesus. It was those who were supposed to uphold and know the Torah and know the scripture and the political and power, the rich and the powerful. Now, there's nothing wrong with being rich, believe me. There's nothing wrong with being powerful too. But if you get it into your head too much, then it becomes a wrong place to be. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. I am going to sit down. It's what I conclude. He made himself of no reputation and upon him the form of a servant. Jesus knows that heaven is already secure. And in this scripture, it reminds you and me that heaven is secure. You don't have to try to post and be perfect and try to be all these things. He wants you to know that his mission on earth was to save those who needed a doctor. And his statement in the gospel, he says, I didn't come for the well, I came for those who are sick. So I'll leave you with two questions before I sing a song. Is that okay? Two questions. I, I adopted this from my son and from Andrew. I, I love this. I love this. I love these young preachers. You know, you learn a lot from them. And thank you for that. I'll leave you two questions. What is God really like to you? And are we willing to, like, to, uh, to be like him towards others? That's your own personal answer. I'll leave that with you as you leave this beautiful place. And my second question is this. This is the question I love using all the time. If Jesus was to come right now, are you certain that you have touched someone's heart to know him? Many years ago in the struggle of ministry and the struggle of being a single dad, I wrote this song out of the grief of my heart. And I always dream that if I have enough money, I will actually do a recording, and this will be the, the title of an album, this song. Sorry, team, can you flick it over to the next slide, please? Sorry, I've left. If you can see it, it's actually in, in small print. But I've entitled, The Cross Was Meant For Me. There's a life that is precious than mine. Man with words could ever describe how through pain he endured for my gain. The cross was meant for me On the hills of Calvary As he hung there with thieves beside I was on his mind The cross was meant for me But yet he set me free I now can live with confidence My Savior paid my day Through the ages of 
this world. One man, yes, one story is all I like to tell. How he gave his only life for the ransom of humankind. The cross was meant for me. On the hills of Calvary As he hung there with thieves Beside I was On his mind The cross was meant for me But yet he set me free I now can live with confidence My Savior paid my debt I now can live with confidence My Savior paid my Let's be upstanding for our benediction, please. (coughs) Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. And thank you, Lord, for teaching us to humble ourselves in the trench of life, just like you did, in order to save a soul for your kingdom. It's not the thousands that we baptize. It's the one single soul that make you party in heaven. And I pray, Father, as we leave this place, may your arms of comfort be around us. May your arms of protection be around us. And make us, Lord, represent you through our actions to others who haven't known about you so that they may see you, Lord, and glorify your name. My humble prayer. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Let the church say.